Hello and welcome to Impact the Borough, a podcast from the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce. I'm Brent Christensen, President and CEO of the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce. Each week, a Chamber staff member will sit down with a guest to discuss what we're doing to start and grow businesses, create quality jobs, develop our workforce, and tell the inspiring story of Greensboro to the world. This podcast is brought to you by Truliant Federal Credit Union a modern, mission-driven financial institution focused on the needs of its members, the businesses it serves, and our community. With five locations in Guilford County, including a dedicated commercial lending office at Friendly Center and a highly rated mobile banking app, Truliant makes it their business to help you grow yours. Visit truliant.org for more information. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we at the Chamber are working with community partners to mitigate its effects on businesses, both large and small. Each weekday at 3 p.m., we are hosting a daily action call with various experts who can point you to resources and answer questions. In lieu of our regular podcast episodes, we will be sharing highlights from these calls with you each week during this unprecedented time. To hear these discussions in full or to join future calls, visit greensboro.org backslash COVID-19. Our uh, daily action call. Um, I think this is probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seventh call, sixth or seventh call. Um, the purpose of these calls is to connect you with resources that uh, that you need in these challenging times, these unprecedented times. And so um, we're we've got a great topic today for those of us who are new to working remotely. Um, we've got some experts on on how to work remotely and how to how to uh, continue to manage your team and inspire your team. Uh, remotely. So um, we will get to that in just a second. You can follow us on social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at GSO Chamber uh, for the latest information. Another thing that I'll bring to your attention is that group chat uh, dialogue. Uh, That is how we take questions. Um, So if you get a chance to uh, ask a question in that particular box, that will help us as we go through this. We're also sending out daily emails to our members with a recording of these calls, as well as any relevant links. Um, So you should be on the lookout for that. We have summarized the call and give you all the information that you need. If you're not a member and you're on this call, all all links to those resources and the recordings are on our website at greensboro.org backslash COVID-19. That's greensboro.org backslash COVID-19. Um, you'll have all of that on there as well as today is uh, is Takeout Tuesday. So for those of you all who can take out from a local restaurant, they will really appreciate it. There is a listing on that uh, on that website at uh, backslash COVID nineteen of those restaurants. One more thing I want to bring up before we um, before we get started here: uh, North Carolina right now ranks forty first in the country for census completion. Let that sink in for a second. 41st. So please fill out those census forms while you're at home. An accurate count means extra funding for our community. Uh, We're going to need that as we come out on the other side of this. Um, And so please, please, please fill out that census form. Uh, Before we roll into our regularly scheduled uh, speakers today, I did, uh, we did have an opportunity to have uh, Congressman Mark Walker join us today. Uh, he is the uh, he's been representing the North Carolina six district since 2015. As if you all are reading up and and are watching the news, you know that we're in the midst of phase three of uh, the relief for COVID-19, and especially uh, as it relates to small businesses and and business in general. And so, I wanted to bring Mark on for him to say a few words, kind of bring us up to speed with where we are on that, how we might be able to help him, hopefully. We won't get into too much of a, of a partisan politic discussion, but more about what we need to do moving forward and how we can help him. And then also, Mark, I think uh, you have a, a larger call tonight as well that uh, we'll be happy to share information on as well. So, Congressman, I'll yield the floor to you and, and let you take it from here for a little bit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Christensen, for inviting me to join you on your call this afternoon. Yes, there is much going on, and I will tell you, uh, your leadership is very much appreciated. Uh, just quickly, yes, tonight we have uh, what we're trying to do every Tuesday evening is, is have some kind of informative teletown hall. Uh, last Tuesday evening, uh, Mayor Vaughn and I 
uh, along with Mike Sprayberry uh, and some physicians talked about health side. Tonight, we're going to move to the small business with Thomas Stiff, District Director for SBA. We'll have a uh, representative from the U.S. Department of Labor, as well as Scott Daughtry and some other people. Again, Mayor Vaughn and I will be uh, helping to lead that, facilitate it. Uh, just, a, just a quick word as, as far as where we are on the health side before getting into the business. Uh, North Carolina uh, is around 420 cases uh, that have been diagnosed. Uh, fortunately, uh, May God continue to bless us here, knock on wood. We've had zero fatalities from it. Uh, we're, we're certainly looking at that. Uh, I will say the task force uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, getting information from Mr. Pence today, Vice President Pence, uh, he is saying that there has been no discussion uh, for a stay-at-home order at this point. Uh, and I think that's uh, certainly uh, important for us to continue to talk about there being some success on the uh, clericoin uh, that's still still being tested, but we're hopefully seeing some results there uh, as we move forward. Uh, we did talk about, you mentioned specifically, there's been three phases. Let me just take one minute to kind of review what that means for each particular sector. Phase one uh, was signed into law on March 5th. It was about $8.2, $8.3 billion in federal funds 3.1 billion dollars for vaccine research and development. Two billion dollars was directed to the states for local response efforts. 100 million for community health centers. Uh, 61 million to strengthen the, the uh, medical products sector. And then 20 million of that uh, first phase was to the small businesses to assist them uh, affected by the outbreak. Phase two was signed Saturday a week and a half ago, uh, about one o'clock in the morning. This assisted families. Uh, through free COVID-19 testing, specifically for the seniors, if that was going to be a stumbling block. It also increased funding for special supplemental nutrition, uh, women, infants, and children. Uh, some of you will see the uh, school buses that are traveling around. There was $500 million for those foods, Ex expanded the unemployment insurance, and it created a new family uh, paid leave program, providing up to 12 additional weeks. Uh, for those impacted. Uh, now, now we're here at phase three, which has been, as we've seen the news, being negotiated back and forth. Uh, you're probably looking at two plus trillion dollars on it. Uh, president's made it very clear uh, that he wants the full federal government in behind this, uh, mitigating it as we move forward. Uh, national emergency has been declared. We've even declared uh, what we call uh, basically is something that allows the government to force manufacturers to engage in a way what they call Defense Production Act. Peter Navarro has said we've not had to enforce that because of so much uh, people like GE and Ford engaging, even changing over ventilators, et cetera, et cetera, without getting too much in the weeds there. Uh, in wrapping up here, uh, we have uh, the president uh, did announce an executive order yesterday to supply the medical equipment and certainly prevent some of the price gouging that we've seen on. So that's that's an that's an overview. Uh, if there are, and I'm with, I'll certainly be sticking around the line, if there's specifics as far as dollar for dollar and some of that, we can get into that as far as what is needed. The last thing that I'll say on the state level uh, is this discussion about essential or non-essential business registrations. There's a website that's readync.org, R-E-A-D-Y-N-C.org, that you can apply. Uh, there's also a phone number that, and an email that goes with that. The phone number is 919-825-2564 or B-E-O-C for Business Emergency Operations Center, B-E-O-C at N-C-E-M.org. That email address is B E O C at ncem.org if you have questions or if you're trying to apply uh, to be qualified as an essential business. So I'll stick around. I'll look forward to listening. And Brent, if there's anything else that I can jump in from an assistance standpoint as far as specific cash flow or numbers of, of what it looks like for small businesses, uh, I'll happy to stick around and do what I can. Uh, thanks yeah. for allowing me to be here today. I appreciate it. And thank you for that, uh, for that information about essential business. We've had a number, especially in our manufacturing uh, community, be asking about that particular uh, registration. So I appreciate that. We've sent a lot of folks in that direction. I hope that uh, um, that they've gone ahead and registered. I know that there's no discussion of 
of shelter in, in place, although you're starting to see some communities, I think Mecklenburg just decided to shelter in place a few minutes ago. Um, so we're starting to see um, the list of shelter in place uh, communities and states grow. Um, and so, uh, you know, that we, we have to be ready for that. <laughs> you have to be prepared. The, the, the folks that will do best in this situation are those that, that are prepared. So let's make sure that we're registering for that regard. And, and, and Congressman Walker, is there anything we can do to help you get this across the finish line? I heard somebody say it was at the two yard line. Um, you know, let, uh, what do we got to do to get it the, the remaining two yards? Cause we're, uh, we're anxious. And I know there are a lot of, a lot of folks in the business community are anxious and, and just waiting to see what kind of assistance the federal government's going to provide so they can keep things moving. Well, thank you, Brent. Uh, uh, as you related to earlier, this is not, uh, or alluded to, this is not a time for, for partisan politics. And I, I, I believe that is registering with the amount of Americans saying, you know what, let's get beyond this. You can have these uh, party fights later on. And listen, it, it, it be remiss to say if this, it, this isn't, you know, from a fiscal perspective, this is going to be, uh, this is, this is, we've never done anything like this before. However, when you're facing emergency time and needs, it's why I voted for phase one, it's why I supported and voted for phase two. This is something that we've got to basically could be the life of death of our economy. Uh, we've, we've had uh, three years, and in, in fact, without being, again, partisan, uh, uh, even during President Obama, there was a turn in our economy. Uh, for the for a huge upswing, uh, President Trump, I believe, has built on that, uh, and and for us to be able to have a chance to get back certainly close to that and continue to propel, we need this phase three. I think that uh, uh, there is word it, it could be either late tonight or early tomorrow morning that this would be moved. Uh, the House, I believe, could pass it. And I'm getting the weeds here, but the House, the House, we hope, has, can pass it by unanimous consent. But according to House rules, if there's one single House member that goes to the floor that blocks it. It would slow it down and uh, forcing all of us to get back to D.C. to vote mm. on the floor to get this to the president's desk. So that's what we're hoping that people see this for what it is and get it done out of the Senate tonight. You see in the House and get it to the president's desk by the end of the week. Great. Great. Well, we appreciate everything you're doing to, to help that through. There are a lot of a lot of people and a lot of businesses counting on it. So we appreciate your your leadership on that. Um, yes, please do stick around. Um, and so let's, uh, let, let's get into what our, what our uh, topic of the day was going to be. Again, thank you, Congressman Walker. Uh, but we've got two additional folks who are joining us. Uh, Sean Kearney, who's the founder of Upgaged. It's a Greensboro-based business design agency who provides consulting, remote workshops, and support to help teams do their best work anywhere, um, especially remotely. We've also got David Horn with us today. David is a Greensboro-based business owner who helps lead several remote first companies, including Honestly, a marketing, advertising, and design uh, collaborative, Loft, a software support company, and First Launch Capital Backs Crew Pay, which is a contractor payments and 1099 platform. Um, hopefully, David uh, Ramsey has got both of them unmuted. David, do I have, David Horn, do I have you? Yes, I'm uh, on Brent. Thanks for inviting me on. Okay, great. And do we have Sean as well? I'm here. Great, Sean. Thank you for being with us uh, today. We appreciate it. Um, I'm going to start with Sean. Um, Sean, you know, you, I know you've worked with over 100 organizations and, and teams to transmission to remote work. Everybody's uh, news feed is flooded these days with, uh, with hey, remote work, this. And, and, and a lot of us, including the chamber team have kind of been thrown into this right one day we're working in the office the next day um here we are working remotely from our kitchen table from a from a desk in a in a spare bedroom that sort of thing um what's different about now what 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 kinds of things should we be thinking about uh and, and since we're we've been kind of pushed into this new reality yeah, that's a great question. So again, first of all, thanks for inviting me to the session and, and whatever I could do to help. So I've been on many of the daily action calls up until now, really trying to listen to the issues that are impacting the Greensboro business community. And I think, first of all, I just want to acknowledge you, Brent, and the team, because what you're doing in terms of keeping people informed every single day, being able to turn this up as quickly as you have and do it as effectively as you have, it's really inspiring. Um, it's great to have uh, Congressman Walker on here with us as well. 
Um, it shows some great leadership. It's really the kind of thing that I wish more companies would, would be doing. Because as you mentioned, we've worked with all these different organizations around the world, you know, every size, every industry, every type, including nonprofits, government, education, et cetera. And what we know is all organizations struggle at times with having their teams work remotely, especially at times when they're going through some kind of transition. So most of our experience in the past, and same thing with our colleagues, has been transitions around things like mergers, acquisitions, outsourcing, maybe you know, chasing some big you know, ambitious goal. But what's different about today is that obviously it's not just you know, dipping your toe in this anywhere workforce water. Everybody's been thrown into this. And it's not just themselves, but their family members and all these other factors that make this a much more complex situation. Um, and a lot of the best practices that we've provided and we've offered in the past were really about aligning with those aspirational goals, you know, grow your business, cast a wider talent net, better engage your employees, get more productivity, et cetera. This is different, right? This is about like, how do we, first of all, survive and continue to operate and continue to take care of one another in this, this environment? And, you know, we, we are hearing every day from people telling us what they've been told to do as best practices that maybe were appropriate in that world, um, but certainly aren't today. I mean, things like, well, make sure you can find a space in your house where you won't be interrupted. Well, that doesn't work when you've got everybody home. Or, you know, if you get bored or you want to get some contact, go out to the coffee shops. And like, we know that doesn't work. But we've also heard people doing things like, hey, turn on your webcam all day long so your supervisor can make sure that you're working. Um, or take a selfie every 10 minutes to show that you're actually at your desk. And I really wish I was making that stuff up. Um, <laughs> and I think we all know what the consequences of that are going to be long term. So when we're talking about best practices for today, a lot of it is very similar to what you're doing yourselves, which is get on a call every single day with people and start out by asking them, how are you doing? And we've actually got a process. We'll share it with people uh, after this call. That's six steps. It's relatively easy to do, but it does take a daily commitment to pull it off, just like what you've done here, you know, with this daily commitment. And it starts with make a list of the five or 10 people that you know, and it could be in your organization. It could include your partners, your suppliers. It could include even your customers and say, who are those people that I believe others turn to when they need information, when they need advice, or when they need help? And then reach out to those people and ask them, okay, what are you hearing? How are you doing? You know, what are people asking you for? What are you telling them? What kinds of best practices are you hearing from those people that really seem to have some legs that are applicable to these common themes? And then start bringing that back, you know, review it together with your leadership team and say, look, every day we're going to post some stuff that comes directly from us. We're going to record videos of us at home. So they can see, yeah, we're in the same situation as everybody else. And then say, this is what we've been hearing. You know, pick maybe one issue at a time. Here's some of the themes that we've been hearing that we know are concerning you because we've been talking to you. Here's some of the things that we've been hearing in terms of what you're doing that seems to be working that we want to share with other people. And then if you've got other things that you can recommend, let us know. And I can, I can guarantee that if you're doing that on a daily basis, it will make a difference. People will know, number one, you care because you're listening. You know what the issues are that affect that, pe that population specifically. You're providing recommendations that come out of those real people. You're acknowledging those people. And you're demonstrating that you're open to new ideas and that you want to continue to lead based on understanding what the community is going through. So I know that's a long answer. Um, and again, we'll provide a copy of the exercise. We think it's really powerful. People have told us every time that they've done it, it makes a gigantic difference. Um, and we think that that can make a difference for everyone here too. Great, great. David, I'm going to turn to you because a lot, of, again, I, I, as I mentioned, a lot of us are, are new to this remote work thing. Um, you just heard Sean talk about um, video cameras being on or webcams being on all day, selfies. Um, but what I want to get to is etiquette. What are, what are some things in terms of etiquette um, that we can that we can all be focused on uh, as we're working remotely. 
Um, what, what, what are what are some some unique things uh, for remote working etiquette that we ought to be aware of? Sure. No, thanks, Brent. And Sean, I mean, fantastic response. I think there was so much uh, you know, rich uh, thought process around just working remotely and, and the, the, you know, technology is good enough now to where there are plenty of tools. It's, it's how those tools get implemented and, and, and the thought process around, you know, working uh, in say a location, non-specific place, or at your at your home in this case. Uh, so that's a fantastic uh, response, Sean. Um, uh, you know, from an etiquette standpoint, I, I think there's uh, a little bit to just you know how would we how would we interact with people if they were if they were still in our office. So I think part of it is just taking a, a, a pause and just saying like, okay, there's still a lot that's the same. Um, and it's, you know, being respectful of, of people's time and stuff like that is still there. I think about just from an etiquette standpoint, things that change uh, when you're working with remote teams is uh, communication, uh, while is important in any business, uh, is, I would say, you know, possibly the number one thing that is that changes with remote work. And from an etiquette standpoint, there has to be uh, a little bit of thought around um, the uh, move from, say, real-time communication and being able to walk down the hall and and uh, stop in someone's office or stop them at the water cooler or whatever. Real-time communication versus asynchronous communication, and realizing that uh, there is there are other means to communicate with each other that don't involve uh, kind of interrupting and and um, and kind of messing with the flow. It's already hard enough to be working from home if you've never been there. So just thinking about that, you know, we, a lot of what we talk about internally across our teams is, you know, write first versus speak first. Um, so easy to just walk down the hall and, and you know, put your head into the office of your coworker. Whereas when you're working remotely and there are so many more variables, um, you know, start with writing uh, and, and, and before kind of speaking. I also kind of see things where the phone is kind of the escalation point. So, you know, there's all these tools and Sean can, you know, talk to about these, but there's, you know, Slack and Basecamp and Asana and, you know, zoom that we're on now and all these different things and each of these channels kind of have the their right place for how the communication goes so kind of escalation under uh is from a phone standpoint that's the real-time communication or bit jumping on a video call uh, versus um moving more communication to kind of writing first and taking the time to send it to someone and know that you're not necessarily getting a response back they could be in the middle of something um, uh, or, you know, be kind of want to call themselves or working on something. Uh, so I think that is, uh, maybe the number one thing from a, an etiquette standpoint, the other, uh, a couple other kind of tips is embrace and honor, say quiet time. You know, there are times where people need to be heads down and doing work, kind of embrace that, respect that also office hours. You know, one of the many benefits of working remotely or from home is the convenience of it. Uh, what happens a lot of times, especially when, uh, or at least in my experience, what I've seen is when people start transitioning to remote work, now all of a sudden their office is right next door. It's so easy to just pop in and answer one more email or do one more thing. And so I think it's kind of respecting those office hours and trying to, to uh, uh, keep boundaries uh, as much as possible while you're um, you know, working from home, uh, overwork is a, is a real concern as people make that transition from uh, my experience. Yeah. When you're, when you're always on and the, the office is always there, there's a, it's a big temptation for many to just walk back into the office at any time. Right. Mm-hmm. So, um, let me go back to, to Sean here for just a second. Uh, what, as we transition to this, what, what's the best way to keep your team engaged in your in your work product um especially when yeah again you're not right down the hall you can't just pop your head in um as as david said 
what, what's the, what do you see as the best way or perhaps ways to keep the team engaged? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, and I love what David said too. I mean, I can just in a couple of minutes say, man, I'd like to work with David. Right. And that's the kind of you know, attitude and perspective that I think makes a gigantic difference in this world because engagement is about going back and forth. I mean, I think one of the things that we've seen, and this is a delicate, challenging balance, and I know that everybody who's on this call that's listening right now is in a leadership position, whether that's a formal thing or not, that's the reason why you're here. And as a leader, you know, we're the ones that are supposed to come up with the answers, come up with the plans, you know, provide people some certainty that we know what's going on and that we can help navigate these uncertain times. That's definitely important. And at the same time, you know, one of the things that we know is that any communication that your people only hear from your CEO or the CEO office is a message that nobody's going to really trust. That's just the way it is. Like they've got to hear it from their peers. They've got to have a chance to actually say it themselves and have a chance to talk through it. So the idea that you're going to solve, you know, all of these engagement problems by just communicating blast emails with, you know, PDF attachments on official com company letterhead that say, here's the official messaging. I mean, good luck. I mean, what that will typically do at a time like this is alienate people. Uh, and the, the most consistent response, and you often won't hear it as a leader because people aren't going to tell you, but it's contempt. It's like, you don't understand. Like, th this is not... When we're talking about engagement, we don't mean just getting blast information one way. It's got to be interactive. And it's challenging. Like David mentioned, you know, one of the things that he mentioned that I really loved is that asynchronous versus synchronous and kind of office hours and being respectful of people's time. Because one of the reasons who the people who do remote work love it is because they can often be more productive because they can focus, focus in a way that they normally wouldn't have the opportunity to do. Now, I know the world we're in today, that's not where we are because, again, we've got kids at home. We've got other people that are there that are just in their space that we, we have to be able to take care of. And at the same time, when people get a taste for it and we're being respectful of it and saying, hey, let me ask you questions and listen, as opposed to just telling you our plan, that's by far the easiest way to really engage people. And the last thing I'll say uh, is that... Uh, Again, to kind of reemphasize what David said, start with writing. You know, if you have to call a meeting for all communications, that's just crazy. Like, I know you, you want to stay in contact, but if all you're doing is giving people status updates constantly, um, that's, not, that's not a good use of time. And it's not a good use of, of the power of remote work. It would be better to say, my status updates are going to be in writing. Make sure that you have a chance to read it. If you've got questions, let's get on a call if we need to, or we can get on chat or we can get on Slack and we can uh, discuss it. But really start with, I, I want to have a clear thought that I'm going to communicate before I start you know, bringing it to the world. Sorry, I had to take myself off mute there. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. So, so I want to get back uh, to, to David on this question because I think we're, we're kind of going down this road a little bit in that, you know, organizations have their own culture and that culture in many respects um, relies on interpersonal um, interaction. And we're not getting that to, you know, right now, how do you, how do you maintain and develop a company and organization's culture when you're working remotely? What are the what are the tricks to that? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. That's um, you know, culture is one of those things that uh, gets talked about a lot. And one of the benefits a lot of times to uh, at least historically to having you know going into an office is there's at least a feel more of a feeling a tangible there's a tangible feeling of that. But I think remembering that culture is um, that one of the best. Uh, examples or, or metaphors I've heard of this is, you know, culture is the patina of the organization. You know, it's the weathering and the, and the people's experiences and them like working through things together over time. And so I think, you know, culturally uh, kind of embracing that from a remote standpoint is, is continuing the communication. Um, I think there's also uh, just uh, as Sean alluded to, 
you know, multiple touch points. So some things that, you know, I, I, all I can speak from is my experience, right? So I'll, I'll kind of speak, speak to that. Um, you know, one thing is, is thinking about, you know, process in times of, um, uh, with working remotely, especially if you're bringing on new employees or uh, new people working, or, or this is new, is, is kind of thinking about prioritizing kind of that process, starting to document all the stuff you do, um, so that as people come on, they're that they're they're able to kind of step into that. Uh, you know, team calls, like uh, Sean talked about. You know, there there are the times where people do need to get together and see each other's faces and socially interact. Look for opportunities to do that. I've seen instances where. You know, depending on what tools you use, there's some sort of shout out where um, I think Sean mentioned this also, where you know you have maybe each week one employee kind of shouting out another employee who uh, showed or ex you know lived out a value of the company while you know during that week with some interaction that maybe historically could have been picked up by multiple people, but when folks are remote there needs to be more documentation and, and more uh, uh, like promotion and edification of those folks. So those things, um, you know, across our companies, one of the things we do is the, it is I still think, while it shouldn't be the only uh, communication, uh, leadership should send out something weekly. So we do what we call what update and every week it goes out and just kind of gives a, a rundown of everything that's going on and, and um, in talking about, people edifying people and, and what's going on in the, in the company um i even have seen a lot of companies do this that we've worked with that are remote teams they'll do you know peer lunches or something like that where you use some of the non-productive time when it's okay you know it's planned a non-productive time to uh you know jump on a video chat for for just to grab you know a bite or drink coffee together. I think it's okay to have kind of those water cooler moments, even when working re remotely and it, and worth making time for those. Um, but you know, just to kind of recap, so documentation, so documenting those things that are important to the company so that they're visible to everyone, the communication by, you know, multiple people, uh, throughout, um, you know, this is also a time where one-on-ones are really, really important for leadership. To, to meet with other folks on the, the team to see how things are, are going. Um, we, we'll do uh, something we learned from another company called Hang Tens, where they're kind of organized 10 minute interactions between people that wouldn't normally interact with each other, maybe across to different departments and those types of things. Um, and so the communication piece uh, and, then, uh, and then just uh, kind of embracing kind of the, what are, what are the, processes that need to be in place that uh, free us up to kind of focus on these other intangible things. Gotcha. Gotcha. Sean, back to you. You, you mentioned to me on our call yesterday that uh, you have a five step process or five step exercise that you take people through in terms of setting up remote uh, work uh, procedures and remote work can you can you walk us through those relatively quickly? And I know you you said you were going to provide that to us, so that's something that we can we can send out to everybody uh, a little bit later. But I'd love for you to kind of walk us through just kind of the basics on that, if you don't mind, for right now. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I, I think it's a good idea if you're willing to do it to even do some of it right now as we're talking. I mean, you're already on this call, um, so you know why not take it take a minute or two because getting it started is a good place. To go, I think, um, and similar to what David just said, I wanted to kind of build upon that because when he was talking about facilitating communication among people who don't normally interact with one another, we know in a lot of organizations that includes leadership that doesn't normally interact with you know the masses. You know, anybody that you're more than a hundred yards away from, even if you're in the same building, you could kind of argue you're working remotely compared to them. So that's not necessarily um, something that you can immediately, you can't go back in time and fix it. But what you can do is you can go forward in time and say, you know what, I'm going to acknowledge that as a leader, I really needed to be more interactive and more engaged than I have up until now. 
And now that we're going through this together, this is what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna make a public commitment to you that I'm gonna do this better. Uh, and this is gonna be one of the best ways to demonstrate it. And I know, I know just based on people I've worked with in the past, that is a hard thing to ask. I mean, because leaders already have so many things on their plate. They have so many responsibilities. And sometimes the last that they want is the stress of getting more problems. You know, so and that's going to come from, you know, doing some kind of interaction. But over time, you know, as David mentioned, in terms of building a culture where people can do this and, and rely on one another, what the leader's doing here is modeling this behavior and saying, look, I'm doing it. Please do this too. Don't rely on just us, you know, the leadership team to pull this off. But really, here are the steps. So the first step you can do right now, which is uh, something I mentioned earlier, which is really take a moment and think about who are five to ten people who other people turn to for information, for advice, or for help. That could be people within your organization. Maybe you've got a small organization. You only have five to 10 people or less. You know, like, well, that's everybody. Okay, but what about your customers? Because imagine this. I mean, think about it. Like, how many companies do this? If you right now went out and said, we've been talking to our customers. This is what you've been telling us. This is what you've said are your concerns. This is what we're doing about it. How much more powerful is that than just saying, this is what we're doing? Okay, great. You got a plan, but you didn't acknowledge that it's relevant to anybody, right? I mean, who's your audience? So that's your audience at first, which are the people that are your influencers, the people that others have already built relationships with of trust. Um, and they're the, the ones that are going to drive the future of your organization or maybe even your community. So that's step one. Step two is ask these questions. How are you? And listen, and take some notes, especially if you're, you know, remote, you can take notes and uh, you can do that at a level maybe you would normally in, in person. If you can do it on video, that's even better. Kind of to David's point, this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You'll get some body language, you know, it's, it's more engaging, it's more, more human. But ask, how are you? You know, who, who have you been talking to? Who's been reaching out to you? You know, what are they telling you? Um, what are the people that you're talking to most concerned about or maybe most uncertain about? Um, what are they doing to deal with that situation? And what are some great ideas that you've been hearing? And then if you ask them, like, who, who told you that? Like, who's doing it? Then when you get to one of the later steps, you'll be able to acknowledge that in a way that, again, reinforces you're listening and you're really doing this seriously. And then, and then I always like to ask too, like, well, what other advice have you been offering? Because that's another way of kind of them telling me, maybe as the leader, this is what you should be doing too, Sean. It's like, okay, like that's helpful to know. And then, you know, with any other good listening, make sure that you got it right. You know, say, this, I think this is what you said. This is who you said is doing this. You know, is that right? Great. So that's step two. Step three is then follow up with anybody that you believe uh, has potential solutions that you've heard from. So if David says, hey, you know, talk to Brent or talk to Lou Ann, then I want to talk to both of them and say, hey, what do you hear? I'm going to ask the same exact questions. I'm going to go through the same thing, even if I've never met them before. And I might start out by saying, hey, I'm sorry that I haven't had a chance to meet with you before. I really want to do better in the future. You know, would you be willing to help me and help your peers and your colleagues and your community, your customers? They're always going to say yes. I mean, because they're the people that are doing this. Um, then review your notes. Kind of look for those you know, patterns of potential solutions. And then the next step is create these videos. And if you've got a social knowledge tool, if you've got an intranet, if you've got even, a, even if you don't have it, you can create an unlisted YouTube channel and start sending links to people. But film them in your house where you were clearly at home. So even if you have a home office that looks like an office, go to a place that doesn't look like that. Like, you know, think about the audience that you're speaking to. Keep it short. And say, hey, you know, this is, let's say, it's me. I'll say, hi, this is Sean. I want to let you know we've been hearing a lot of the concerns that you have. Here's one of the ones that uh, we heard about just today. Um, I think a lot of you probably are experiencing some of the same things. Um, and here's some great ideas that we've heard from these people. And if you acknowledge not only who they are, but where they are. So, for example, I have a client who has everybody un under one roof, but they are remote to one another. They have the plant people and the office people, and they don't talk to one another, or at least they didn't before we worked with them. Um, and we would say, okay, this person from the plant said this. 
this person from accounting said this, you know, that way people are like, oh, okay, I know who these people are. And it's another way of, you know, just strengthening um, some connections that maybe weren't there before, you know, encouraging people, like David said, to talk to people who maybe they haven't talked to in the past. And then the last part is, you know, anybody who comments on those videos, because you're going to say all those things I said, and then at the end, tell us what you think. Tell us what you're hearing. Tell us what you're concerned about. Tell us what um, you think people are doing that really is making a difference. You know, it's usually easier to acknowledge other people than to kind of do it yourself. And then if you really want to take it further, then you can turn all of your all hands meetings into some level of Q&A, at least in the, in the beginning. Start out with the same types of questions and then demand this, you know, if you're in that position, because let's face it, you know, we're in an uncomfortable situation that's going to turn into new habits. So ask people more than what you would have asked maybe in the past. That's even more uncomfortable because they can take it, uh, especially if they know why and they, they trust you're doing it for the right reason. But tell your leadership team, every time we come together, I'm going to ask you, how are you doing? Who are you talking to? And what are they saying? And if you say they're not talking to anybody, then we need to have a, some discussion. You need to be talking to your people. Yeah. Uh, every time we talk, I need to be hearing who you're talking to um, and how you're staying connected and what you're doing to, to provide support. Yeah. If you sure. do that, it's really hard, but it makes a giant difference. And you're right. We are, we are, we are building new habits uh, every day in this environment, right? This is not something that any of us has experienced. Um, and so, you know, when you have a, when you have a new experience, it gives you an opportunity to build new habits, whether they be good ones or bad ones. So they're good ones in this regard. Absolutely. So Sean, I'm going to, I'm going to save the last question for you because we've had one commenter and, and we'd love to see some questions if you've got them, um, who talked about a tool called teams. What, what tools do you see in this space, in this remote workspace um, that you think work really well? to, to kind of help um, teams continue to engage remotely? Yeah, I would say, I mean, so anybody who out there supports IT, I don't want any of them to come kill me. So <laughs> I want to be respectful of those people first, right? I mean, we know how much disruption we got into with bring your own device. And now it's not even a big deal for most companies anymore. Right. But this is different because now you're talking about team tools. So bring your own team tools. That's a little bit different because you've got other people that need to use them. So I'm, I'm going to guess that most people are familiar with Slack. Uh, the benefit of Slack, and one of the reasons it, it really took off, particularly in the tech community when it got started, was because it was a good alternative to email. So it's not something that most people use um, you know, for internal communications, both. Uh, a lot of companies have transitioned to say, Hey, email is only for external communication and Slack is only for internal. The benefit of doing it is that it's a little bit more intuitive. It does, there's a learning curve like with anything, um, but it's persistent. That's one of the biggest things about it is that if you've got stuff in there that you've discussed and maybe it was a year ago, well, you don't have to go searching through all these email threads. Slack has an amazing search built into it that you can use to find it. You can determine like who's going to see the message and who won't, but it's all in the same system so that if anybody needs to get access to it later, that's where it is. And that's one of the gigantic benefits. So if you've ever been in a situation where you had to like forward a whole bunch of documents to somebody who's maybe just joined the team or brand new to the company, well, Slack, all those documents are already in there. So you can help them say, these are the ones you're looking for. They can find them. They can put them in different folders, you know, different uh, channels. Microsoft Teams is essentially a Slack. I'm, I'm sure my friends at Microsoft would hate me for saying this, but it's kind of a Slack clone to some degree. It does have some of its own features, which I really like as well. The reason that you would use Teams, though, is if you're already on a Microsoft platform, so you're already using, let's say, um, Office 360 or you're on some kind of enterprise solution with Microsoft, it makes sense to use Slack. You're already paying for it. It's already integrated. It re works really beautifully with all of the other Microsoft suite tools. Um, and uh, it's got some nice other stuff in it too, but it's the basic same idea. Um, and both of those platforms are growing like crazy 
uh, especially over the last few weeks, because it went from a, oh, that's cool, to like, we need something. We have to have something. Maybe this is it. Right. And then the other big one is video conferencing. So, you know, and if anybody out there has any questions about any of this stuff in terms of tools, please just reach out and contact me because I'm happy to, to help you. Uh, you know, this is not about trying to build, you know, new revenue at this point. This is about just helping this community. So I promise, you know, if you say, hey, I want to know, you know, what you think about this or what tool is better for that, I will do everything I can or somebody on my team to help you because we have done so many hours of work. We would hate to see somebody else, you know, struggle with this stuff when we've already figured it out or, right. or we at least think we've already figured it out and we can provide, you know, some support. Learn, learn from some others' mistakes, right? Learn, learn what might be best for them. David, yeah, we've made a lot of mistakes. David Horn, do you have anything to add to that in terms of tools that you see out there that are better than others? Here we are on Zoom. Yeah, uh, Zoom, uh, you know, Uber Conference, uh, Google Meet. You know, there's a, a bunch of them. Um, I, I think I would just to maybe <clears throat> approach it from a little different angle. I, my, my thinking has always been as few tools as possible, mm -hmm. and the tools that people will use. So. Um, and I think part of that too is, uh, again, going back to kind of onboarding process and, and, and helping people, uh, understand, you know, how to best work, uh, from a home environment is like, a I wouldn't say you wouldn't say this to them necessarily, but like, you have to use the tools. I mean, whatever the, t your team, your company decides to do or use like they need to be used to make this all work. I mean, communication, prioritization, social connection, all these things that we've talked about, trust, autonomy, they happen because we have these technologies available, uh, fortunately to, to be able to do that. I mean, things that we just, I just did like a, we think about like one password, like if you don't have a password manager, um, there's a couple of them out there. We use one password, but just a, a way to share um, passwords and stuff. Project management tool. If you have projects, we use Basecamp. There's a bunch of them out there. Mm -hmm. You all mentioned you know video tools and chat like Slack. You know documents, share documents, uh, whether it's you know Microsoft product or Google Drive or Dropbox or whatever. Um, and then, uh, uh, but I think the the biggest thing is identifying what the the, the job that the tool does having everyone buy into it and use it the way the company wants to use it. And then as, as few tools as, as possible, um, just the ones that you need and uh, not having a, a bunch of different tools for, you know, because right. You right. <laughs> so I, that, that would be the only thing I would add from my experience. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, gentlemen, I'm not seeing any more questions on the on the chat group. Uh, so thank you again for your time. You've given us an awful lot to think of. Uh, I know you're going to provide us some additional links to be able to share with anyone. Uh, we're all still getting adjusted to uh, to this. I, I think the good news is that we're going to get through this. It's a temporary situation, but you're helping us uh, continue to remain uh, productive and continuing uh, to allow us to continue our corporate culture through a time that that uh, that that's an, a bit of an unknown at this point, but uh, but but we needed those tools to help us get through and continue to be productive. So again, thank you for your time and your willingness to to share with everyone today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, and and again, uh, echoing what Sean said earlier, this is a, a great resource for the community, and you know, appreciate you all putting this together especially daily. I mean, that takes quite a commitment with everything going on. So thanks to the chamber for, uh, for serving the community in that way. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. Uh, yeah. And I agree. I, th I think, um, you know, to kind of build upon that too, it's good to keep in mind that it's around 60, 66 days to develop new habits like this. We're going to be developing new habits. You know, we know we're in this for at least a couple of months. We're going to be different on the other side of this in terms of our behavior now is a good time to start thinking about that, even though we have so many other things, you know, on the front of our minds. It's like, who do we want to be when this is over? And there, there's a phrase that crisis reveals character. 
I mean, this is the time for us to step up and to help each other. And hopefully one day look back and say, hey, we, we took action that we're really proud of, that was uncomfortable, that helped other people, and we're all better off for it. So, um, you know, with that, again, I want to thank everybody, you know, for their attention. You know, again, if there's anything we can do to help, we really want to help you. And, uh, and thanks again, Brent, for, for inviting us. My pleasure. Uh, and Sean, thank you again. What a great message. So um, I, will, I will sign off with this. Uh, Congressman Walker, again, I know you've got a, a call this evening at six o'clock. Again, thank you for uh, being willing to do that on every Tuesday evening. Uh, you can go to Congressman Walker's uh, Twitter account, uh, and I can tell you all that information is right there for you to be able to join. So make sure that uh, if you'd like to be on that call, you, you can be on that call this evening. Uh, one of the, the other side of working remotely is uh, sometimes it, it can open up our uh, IT systems to uh, some issues. So tomorrow's call, we're planning on having a, 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 a cybersecurity attorney um, on with us from Brooks Pierce that can talk to us about what we need to be thinking about that in that regard uh, going forward. So, um, you know, there are, there are some things that, that working remotely opens us up to that, that we might not expect. And so we'll bring him on board to kind of give us some pointers on uh, how we protect ourselves and our organizations and our businesses uh, going forward. Again, before we sign off, um, census, 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 fill out your census. And of course, uh, blood, please give blood. Um, it is uh, vitally needed right now at our hospitals, uh, especially at Cone Health. So go to oneblood.org and um, please sign up to give blood as soon as possible. So with that, we'll look forward to seeing everybody again tomorrow at three o'clock. Again, Congressman Walker, David Horn, uh, Sean, uh, thank you for being on with us, Sean Kearney. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow at three. Okay, thanks. Thank you all. Thank you very much. This podcast is brought to you by True Lion Federal Credit Union, a modern, mission driven financial institution focused on the needs of its members, the businesses it serves, and our community. With five locations in Guilford County, including a dedicated commercial lending office at Friendly Center and a highly rated mobile banking app, True Lion makes it their business to help you grow yours. Visit truelion.org for more information. You can find all of our episodes on YouTube thanks to our video sponsor, North State. Impact the Borough is recorded at Press Play Studios. Producers are Brody Cohen Glaze and Holly West. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at GSO Chamber. See you next time.